Alrighty. Hello. Hello there, everyone. This is Dr. Dino once again. So, uh, after my debate, quote unquote, with, uh, <laughs> with uh, Ken Tobin last week, I kind of got an itch to dive a little bit into human evolution. Uh, so, I'm going to be going through the human lineage, I'll be explaining some stuff about uh, evolution along the way, about primate biology in particular. Should be fun. And uh, also, if y'all have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on it. I'll be keeping an eye on it. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have that are relevant to the topic. Uh, and uh, hello, Ivan. Hello, hello. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, might as well get started. This is a dino's dive into human evolution. So first off, the real quick format of how this is going to go. The genus and or species I'll be talking about is going to be at the top, followed by the name translation. There will be a list of important characteristics that I'll go over one by one. And I'll often have a few pictures just to show you what they would have looked like. And as an example, we have our first hominin, or ape that's within the human lineage. Sahelanthropus chadensis, translating to the man from the Sahel region of Chad. Now, this ape lived about seven to six million years ago, and it was most likely a biped. Now, all we really have to go off of is one skull. <laughs> So all the data we've gathered is from that one skull. There was also a femur found nearby that may or may not be associated with the individual. So for now, I'll just be sticking with the skull. Now, how can we tell that it was most likely a biped? Well, the biggest clue is one particular trait in the skull called the foramen magnum. Now, this is where your nerve cord enters your skull. And as you can see here in humans, it's right at the very bottom. But in chimpanzees, it's much closer to the back of the skull. And in Sahelanthropus, it was right up here, pretty much the same as in modern humans. So, more likely than not, it was a biped, unless it habitually held its head pointing towards the ground, which isn't very common. Also, just based on some characteristics, sorry, some characteristics of the skull, it was most likely a male. At least this one individual was, but it had small canine teeth, and that'll be important going forward. It also actually has its own name. The researchers who discovered it named it Tomai, which is a uh, a name given to local children. Uh, I I believe local boys that are born. Um, when the dry season is approaching. So it sort of means like a hope for life. Which, yeah, I think that's kind of a fitting name. Just a little bit. Also, wonderful uh, reconstruction down here by uh, Bevan Novak, 0232 from DeviantArt. They have a lot of cool stuff, but I only used a picture or two. Please do check them out. Please do check out all the artists I have in this stream. They, they all have lots of good stuff. All right, moving on. Primate Biology 101, Sexual Dimorphism. Now, this is a very important topic in, study, in the study of primates. First off, what is it? Well, sexual dimorphism is a sex-based difference in the expression of specified traits within a species. Uh, you can think of this in, like, a deer. In most deer, the males have antlers. The females don't. Or the males at least have much larger antlers to fight with each other. Primates have a lot of differences kind of like that. Uh, and in primates, the degree of sexual dimorphism has implications for the species' social structure. So the more dimorphic they are, the, sorry, the more dimorphic they are, the more likely it is that the males will have harems of females. But the less dimorphic, it's more likely for mating pairs to develop. 
So a couple examples. Human and chimps have a low degree of sexual dimorphism. So they often form pairs or they're promiscuous. You know, they'll just have partners whenever they want if they like them. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum are gorillas and orangutans. They have a very high degree of sexual dimorphism. Gorillas have their own harems, and orangutans, male orangutans, will fight over wide stretches of forest for access to females. Just a second. Du -du -du. There we are. All right, anyway. And here are some very common sexually dimorphic characteristics in primates. You can probably see at least a few of these in male and female humans. Now, keep in mind, these are general trends. There are always going to be exceptions because, what do I always say? Biology is messy. It's super messy. But these are the general trends. So the first is body size. Males are usually larger. The degree of how much bigger they are can very much depend. Uh, it could be as low as, say, 5% uh, greater in terms of mass or height to being up to three or even four times the mass of the females of the species. It really depends. Uh, muscle mass is another characteristic. Males, usually more muscular. Males often fight for females or fight to protect females in primates. So the males are generally bigger and stronger. Up next is the hip and birth canal width. Now this trait is usually wider in females. Females typically have bigger hips when it comes to primates because they have to pass the baby through the birth canal. And, well, especially in humans and human-like primates, they, they tend to have the babies be pretty big-headed, so there needs to be a lot of space for the baby to pass through. They can only squish so much, you know? Up next is bone density and bone thickness. Now, both of these traits are usually greater in male primates, so they're going to have thicker, bulkier bones. And lastly is canine size. Uh, canine size is usually larger in males, uh, and it can be much larger when they compete for mates. Uh, you can definitely see this in gorillas especially. They have huge fangs, whereas uh, apes like uh, bonobos and humans have very... We don't have much dimorphism in our canine earn their canines at all so just a quick second anyway uh, i am still keeping an eye on the chat folks once again if you have any questions feel free to send them my way happy to answer all right now we have our next hominin this is a roran tuganensis the original man of the Tugan Hills, also known as the Millennium Man. Now, Aurora Tugenensis lived roughly six million years ago, and it was most likely a biped. It was an herbivorous omnivore that had small canines, and we have femurs preserved from this species. So we don't just have the skulls, which you can see a couple of them here, we have the femurs themselves. And there's a few parts of the femur that can tell you a lot about how an ancient primate walked. Uh, probably one of the most important is called the bicondylar angle, which is uh, basically how the femur intersects with the tibia, you know, upper leg bone to lower leg bone. Now, if it's at an angle relative to the rest of the femur, then that means usually that the knees are closer together than the hip joints are. And that makes it a lot easier for you to balance on your hind legs. Uh, that said, we do have male and female specimens of the species and small canines. 
meaning they probably pair bonded or were promiscuous. Once again, like humans and chimps. Now, this isn't true for all human ancestors. In fact, it actually really goes back and forth quite a bit. But it's interesting to see these parallels. All right, up next is Artipithecus ramidus, translating to the root of the grounded apes, or the origin of the grounded apes, depending on how you want to translate it. Now, Artipithecus ramidus lived about 4.4 million years ago, and we actually have a few dozen spec or a few dozen individuals of this species. So we can say pretty confidently that they had very low sexual dimorphism. The males and females were very similar. They would have been omnivores, and they had divergent big toes, meaning that their big toes, as you can see down here, were still sticking out relative to the other toes. But their feet, so like their metatarsals down here, were more stiff than in, say, a chimp. Now what does this mean? Well, first, we're fairly confident that they're bipeds due to, again, the form of magnum placement, uh, the bicondylar angle. It's not preserved in this specimen, but it is in others. This is Artie. You might have heard of her. And yes, her, we are fairly sure. Anyway, um, so the divergent big toe means that it would have been easy for her to grasp onto branches and stuff, but it made it easier for her to climb. But the stiff feet means that the feet would have flexed a lot less. Ooh, just cracked my knuckles there. Uh, the feet would have flexed a lot less as she moved, as she walked on the ground. And that really, really helps with uh, preserving or conserving energy and momentum. Alrighty. Now, primate biology 102, bilateral symmetry. And uh, this is a pretty important point, if I do say so myself. So primates, like many other animals, are mirrored across the midline. So if you find half of a skeleton, you can reflect what you have to complete it. And that's why, even though we have missing pieces from Artie here, well, we can reflect the foot bones, we can reflect the leg bones, reflect the hip, the arms, parts of the skull, etc. Then we can fill in the missing gaps with one, just general primate morphology. Primates are pretty similarly built. Um, all things considered, there are just a few differences, biologically speaking. But also just because, like I said, we have like 30 individuals of Artipithecus ramidus. So we can just fill in the gaps with other members of her species. All right. Now up here, we have Australopithecus afarensis, or the southern ape from the Afar region. Now, for those of you who are familiar with human evolution, you might have noticed that I uh, kind of skipped a species or two there. I'm not going to be going over every species in the human lineage just because, well, for one, it's contentious on some of the species. If they are really one species, or if they should be split into two, or three, or even more. And also, just for the sake of simplicity, <laughs> you know, I'm not presenting a straight line. These are all representatives of primate populations at a given time. But you can see a line sort of forming. Anyway, with Australopithecus, they lived between about 3.8 to 2.9 million years ago. Uh, sorry, Australopithecus afarensis. The genus was a bit more widespread than that. Now, this contains arguably one of the most famous fossil hominins, Lucy. Everyone knows who Lucy is, right? possibly one of the most famous human ancestors of all time. Now, Australopithecus was herbivorous, and they exhibited a very high degree of sexual dimorphism. As you can see here in this diagram, males could be as much as a foot and a half taller, 
and up to 50% heavier than females. Well, that's, that's quite a difference. That's more than we see in humans. That's more than we see in chimps. Not as much as uh, gorillas or orangutans, but still quite a bit. Now, this reconstruction down here features Katanumu as a male Australopithecus and Lucy as a female. Now, do keep in mind that once again, we can recon, even though we don't have all the bones from these individuals, we can more or less fully reconstruct them using other individuals from the same species. We have hundreds of them preserved in the fossil record. We have hundreds of our Australopithecus afarensis alone, not even including all the other species of Australopithecus. So this is a pretty good image of what they looked like. And they have a pretty interesting mosaic of traits. Now this video here by the Cat California Act... Wow, I cannot talk at the California Academy of Sciences uh, actually illustrates really well uh, what Australopiths share with humans and with chimps. Now, it does just show Lucy as a female Australopithecus, and I do kind of wish they included a male, uh, but eh, take what you can get. Anyway, here we go. So first up, we have a chimp and Lucy, right? You can see they share an elongated skull with a small brain case. They have face and jaws that jut out from the brain case. Oh, right now go ahead and fix that. And just looking at them side by side, you can see some similarities, but you can also see a lot of differences. And we're going to see a lot more as the video goes on. Now, this is an interesting point here about the shoulder blades. So where the upper arm bone connects with the shoulders is different between Australopithecus males and females. And females, it's much more well adapted for helping them climb. They were much more mobile. Uh, with the males, meanwhile, it seems... Oh, whoops. I'll fix that in a second. It seems like the males spent a lot more time on the ground compared to the females, which is kind of interesting. So even within the same species, there could be differences just based on sex. All right, I'll let it catch back up. All right, and I really like this here. Oh, there we go. I really like this. They show the chimp walking on its hind legs. And you can just see how much more awkward it is for a chimp than it would have been for Lucy. We also have a great comparison here between the arms and the hands. Australopithecus arms were longer relative to their body than in modern humans, and in the females especially. Like I said, they would have been pretty good at climbing. You can just see the chimp really awkwardly amble along there. And bump. All right. So that was the chimp and Lucy. Now how about Lucy and a human? So they are walking different, but you can see they are very similar. And as I talked about before, you have the spine connected to the very bottom part of the head in both Australopithecus and humans. A point about the pelvis here, that's true too. So uh, Homo sapiens have that wide pelvis. Well, one, it, it helps with the muscle attachment sites when your legs are moving beneath the hips like this uh and two to hold your guts and stuff <laughs> it's just better at doing that than the chips and... 
Ah, and here's what I was talking about before with the femur, the thigh bones. You can see in both the human and Lucy, they're angled inward. Helps balance. And the feet too. Feet in both of them are very rigid and help with conserving momentum and energy. So, how about we put all three together, see how they go. The video goes ahead and highlights the similarities once again. And yeah, it's really interesting. You can see how Lucy is very intermediate between chimpanzees and a modern human. And as I said before, this is a great little video done by the California Academy of Sciences. Highly encourage you guys to go check them out. I mean, pr preferably after the stream, but... <laughs> or after the stream is over, but I, I highly encourage you guys to check them out. Also, I think I'm going to switch how I'm showing this. There we go. Gonna go ahead and full screen it for you guys. Make it a bit easier to see. All right. All right. I'm not gonna let the whole video play through again, but yeah, you can see that Lucy moves a lot more similar to a human than she does to a chimp. And we can say that pretty definitively. All right. Now then, we have Primate Biology 103, Parallel Branches. Now, we like to think of human evolution as just one solid line from an ancestor to a descendant. But in reality, it's a lot more complicated than that. Evolution is more like a weird family tree, and even that's a pretty big simplification. So as an example, you and your cousins share a grandparent. But your parent wasn't your grandparent's only child. You have several aunts and uncles, but not all of them have kids. So you can see here, your oldest aunt has three children. They're your cousins. Your next aunt has no kids. And then... Your parent and your uncle both have one child. This is basically what an evolutionary diagram looks like. And now keep in mind, I could uh, I can also change the length of the lines to show how long they live, just to make it a bit more explicit. But I hope this does the job. Like, there are parallel branches going on at the same time in human evolution, and in most lineages, actually. Well, I see we've picked up a few more viewers. Uh, once again, folks, if you would like to ask any questions, feel free to. I'm happy to answer anything you have that is relevant to the topic. Also, hey, Al. Hope it's going well. How's the roads? Uh, quick drink of water there. Now, just got done talking about parallel branches, and here we are at the first one. This is Paranthropus boisei, or Boise's almost human. Now, they lived from between about 2.3 to 1.2 million years ago, and they were full herbivores. Can't really see it well in these pictures, but their molars, teeth at the back of the jaw, are very wide very good at grinding stuff down. And they were very sexually dimorphic. In fact, the facial structure was kind of similar to orangutans, even though they both came to those facial structures independently. Which is kind of interesting. And over here on the left, you can see roughly scaled a female Paranthropus skull and a male 
like I said, they're very sexually dimorphic. Uh, uh, the males are, one, much larger, and two, much more powerfully built than the females. And over here on the right, we have a great reconstruction by Roman uh, Yevseyev. I hope I'm saying that right. Of a Paranthropus male. Uh, oh, Al asks, how do you explain the people who can't follow this, like apologists? I mean, some people are biased. That's honestly my best answer to that. Oh, well, happy to hear you're on vacation. I just got done with mine. <laughs> anyway, so this was an offshoot of Australopithecus. Now, the, the funky thing is, we don't know if we are directly descended from Australopithecus or not. Uh, it seems likely. There are some other apes that we could be descended from, though. Uh, we have a pretty good picture of primate evolution, specifically human evolution, but it's pretty far from perfect. And especially with how messy biology is in general, you know... <laughs> It's hard not to get everything right, or it's hard to get everything right. All right, now we have the first humans, Homo habilis, or the handyman. Homo habilis lived from about 2.4 to 1.4 million years ago and might have come from Australopithecus or, like I said, from another line of humans. And they show the first beginning of the trend of increased brain size. Oh, uh, sorry, I gotta go for just a second. I will be right back. All right, sorry about that, folks. Had to go get something. Uh, oh, actually, we have some uh, good questions in the chat. Uh, how do we fact? Oh, not that one. Uh, how do we factor for deformities? For instance, some people are still born with tails or misformed skulls. That's true, and we do find those in the fossil record. Um. In general, just based on how rare fossils are to form already, it's more likely than not that any fossil we find is going to be from a from an anatomically normal individual. But we do have examples of deformities in the fossil record. Uh, we'll actually have a couple shown in this slideshow, believe it or not. So. It's unlikely for them to appear if we only have one specimen, but in some cases, when we have hundreds or thousands, they do show up. Anyway, good question. What? Let's see. And uh, wouldn't we assume or presume anomalous life existed throughout? From Al. Uh, yes, there's always going to be anomalies. Uh, the main question is first, do they survive to adulthood? And second, do they, do they get preserved? But most things that are born don't make it to adulthood. 
and most things that make it to adulthood don't get fossilized. It's just how the history of life works. Righty. Boop. Anyway, Homo habilis here is the first definitive toolmaker. Their remains are almost always found with stone tools that had to be manufactured. I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Now, they might not have been the first in the human lineage to make tools, but they're the first we can say for sure. There's some evidence that maybe Australopithecines made tools, but we can't be certain. Oh, also, some people want to split Homo habilis into two different species. I'm not going to go into that too much here, but there are differences for sure within the species. Uh, in fact, right here, uh, over on the left, we have what a lot of people want to call Homo rudolfensis. And over here on the right, we have Homo habilis. Homo rudolfensis has, in general, a much larger brain, but they're also larger than Homo habilis. So it's, it's a bit messy. There's also individual variation, of course. Uh, biggest thing is, we just need more fossils. That would really help clear things up. All right. Now, primate biology 104, tool making. Now, many primates are tool users, but some are more proficient at it than others. We have many, many records of chimps and baboons using sticks to like fish out termites or get honey, stuff like that. Um, humans are distinct in that they have a culture of stone and bone tools that they pass down to their children. Uh, so you can see up here, we have some very basic stone tools. We have what's called a hammer stone. Basically, just use it for bashing things like nuts or bones. Uh, we also have choppers. They're a very primitive form of hand axe, which got improved on later. We have some more hand axes over here. As you can see, this one's from China. This one's from India. And this one's from Europe. So these are more often associated with later human remains, which we'll get into later in the presentation. Don't worry. Um, Homo habilis would have been making the most basic stone tools. But you can still tell that they were made because they have very deliberate markings and strike patterns. Like the, the creator had a vision of what they wanted to make when they made the tool. And you can see the marks detailing them going towards that end. And eventually, in the fossil record, we get to stuff like needles, like very, very fine tools, like harpoon points. And what's really interesting is we have records of chimpanzees that are starting to manufacture very, very basic stone tools. So they might be starting to follow in our footsteps. Or maybe they're just aping us. Who knows? Oh, and also these tools, like I said earlier, are often found associated with human remains. But it is rare that they were used on the bones. And this suggests that ancient humans made tools and carried them around. But that brings up a question. Do they just carry them in their hands everywhere? They'd kind of get in the way. Or did they create slings or bags that just didn't get preserved? Like, how old is weaving? We don't know that, but it's a fascinating question. Um, we have another question. Also, hello, desk. Nice to see you. Uh, now that natural selection isn't selecting humans in most parts of the world, do you think humans are getting weaker on average? Oh boy. So that's a very complicated question. It's a very complicated question. 
in a way, yes, we've we've removed or at least very much reduced the effect selective pressures have on humans. Uh, very much so. Um, but at the same time, there are still distinct differences between humans in different parts of the world, though those are mostly ancestral. Uh, it's, it's a very complicated issue. And the thing is, as our technology improves, as our medicine improves, stuff like that, the question comes up, will it matter much anymore? Because if we can compensate for the weaknesses that appear, do they really still matter? Like, uh, like say in hand-to-hand -hand combat, a human will definitely lose to a chimp. Probably would have lost to many of our ancestors. But on the other hand, humans have guns. Modern humans have guns. So through our ingenuity, we can overcome our limitations. It, I hope that makes sense. And especially, actually, as gene editing uh, might eventually soon become a reality, that could really throw a spanner in the works. Because we can just snip out those uh, defects, I guess you could say. That might build up. But this is a complicated, touchy subject, so that's about as far as I'm going to get into it for now. Good question, though. All right. And now then, we have Homo erectus, translating to the upright man. Now, Homo erectus lived all the way from about 1.9 million to about a hundred thousand years ago they were one of the most successful ape species ever and they've been found all over the old world from africa to england from spain to australia from the neck down they were basically identical to modern humans and it seems likely that they were the creators of the first art we have records we have, we have records of they might have been some of the first clothing makers and they could probably speak like modern humans. In basically all the ways that matter, they were human. They were us. And I do think that that is something, I do think that's important to emphasize in these discussions. Like, they are called Homo erectus. We refer to them as Homo erectus. They were humans. So it's important to look at their remains and their culture as a remnant of a long-lost human culture. And they should definitely be treated with the respect that that comes with. All right. Now up here, we have a few possibly Homo erectus, possibly offshoots. But they tell a very fascinating story. Just a second. Just a second. I gotta take care of something. Okay. Anyway. So all of these are uh, Homo erectus possibly, uh, from a place called Dimenisi. They're known as the Dimenisi hominins. And we have five individuals with a bizarre range of variation compared to what we would expect to see within a human population. And it's a pretty good display of just how diverse Homo erectus was as a species. That even within a single population, we can have massive variation. So, they're arranged from left to right, 
from one to five. There were five Dominici hominins found in total. First, most likely a male. Uh, we only have the rear part of the skull to work with, but uh, mostly based on the brow ridges and some other morphology, probably male. Uh, next, we have a female. Uh, she has smaller brow ridges compared to the others, and overall her features are more gray-style, or uh, I don't want to say softer, that's not the right word, but well, more gray-style is the term we use. Uh, we have Mini C3 over here, which fairly standard Homo erectus. And then we have Dominici 4. Now, this guy is pretty interesting for a number of reasons. Now, if you look at this jaw here, you might notice it's a little different from the others. It's way thinner, right? And he has basically no teeth. And that, that's not just from teeth getting lost during preservation. He had, I think it was one tooth when he died, at least as far as we know. Now, some estimates do vary, but a lot of people put him as being around 60 years old. This was a very old man, especially for the time. Like, if you lived a 30 or 40 back then, like you were already an exception. But just based on his remains, it's very unlikely that he would have been able to survive on his own. So he's one of the earliest examples we have of humans caring for each other. Or at least that's how it's often interpreted. Like, he couldn't chew his food. It would have had to have been prepared manually. Or prepared by another individual. Would have been very hard for him to move around. Like, he had to have been cared for, basically. Especially in the harsh world they lived in. It's fascinating. We can see these traces of humanity this far back. And, uh, well, lastly, uh, we have Dominici 5, who is weird compared to the other Dominici hominins. Uh, overall, he has a very, very different facial structure, meaning he may have had a very different ancestry to the rest of the group. He also had a much smaller brain. Uh, most of them are ranging uh, between six and 700 cubic centimeters. His is about 570, so it's way below the range of the rest. Um, he also has very distinctive brow ridges, a very large uh, jaw. He's, you could say, more primitive compared to the others, or at least he appears to be. It's interesting. So we have five individuals here with a lot of variation. And we have another example of Homo erectus. This is Turkana boy. Now, uh, we asked about in chat earlier about uh, uh, deformities in the fossil record. Turkana boy had one. He had a spinal disease. Uh, would have made him... He wouldn't have been able to move near as fast as his fellows. Uh, would have had a pretty stiff, painful back. Uh, and You can't really see it well here, but it was actually curved much more sharply than it should normally be. Uh, we don't know his cause of death, though, but he was a pretty, pretty, pretty complete specimen. Pretty complete fossil. And we have a reconstruction here. Uh, the entire specimen is on display at the Field Museum in Chicago, or at least the full reconstruction. And then we get into something kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> So if you, uh, if you play a lot of games, you might recognize this skull. And I'm just curious, uh, in the chat, can anyone name what game this, uh, the skull is from? I'm just curious. See how long it takes people to figure it out. Mm-hmm. 
Once again, can anyone figure out uh, where this middle skull is from? Just out of curiosity. No idea. Uh, well, it's right here. Uh, it's from Skyrim. And ever since I first played Skyrim, uh, the skull has bugged me. Because it's supposed to be for a, a human. Uh, a Nord, the race is called in Skyrim. Uh, it, it doesn't look like a Homo sapien skull. <laughs> it might, might just be me, but it looks much more like a Homo erectus skull. And I, I just find it kind of weird that that's how they chose to represent the human skull. It's just odd. It's always bugged me. <sighs> anyway, uh, now we have another offshoot of the human lineage. This is Homo Naledi, or the human of the Rising Star Cave. They lived between about three to 200,000 years ago, and they were only recently discovered, only described in, I think, 2015. Uh, they seem to have kept or maybe re-evolved some ancient traits uh, that are actually very reminiscent of an Australopithecine, an Australopithecus. But many of them would have made it pretty good at climbing. Uh, it had relatively longer arms with long grasping fingers. Probably would have been a pretty good climber. But once again, they were human, and it appears that they ritualistically buried their dead. See, we've found most of the, I think most of the Homo Naledi specimens we have in one cave, the Rising Star Cave in South Africa. And they're hidden deep within the cave in a few different chambers, some of which appear to have been carved out and then the body was placed within. So the individual died, and then their group took them in there to bury them. And there are markings on the walls, there's basic cave art. So yeah, they, they took care of their dead. Which might not sound like a big deal, but most animals don't do this. interesting and now we have homo floresiensis the hobbit <laughs> so they lived between 100 and 60,000 years ago and yeah they're known as the hobbit people they're the smallest known lineage of homo C or of homo of genus homo uh in fact, they were only about three feet tall. They, they were tiny. They lived on the small Indonesian island of Flores. They, are, they were an offshoot of Homo erectus. And once again, they were human. Uh, they crafted many tools. I don't know if we have records of them burying their dead. Uh, but we do know that they would have hunted dwarf elephants that were on the island. It, it's just really interesting. Uh, you can see the skull of... Sorry, you could... Sorry, yawned there. It's late for me. We can see the skull of a Homo floresiensis here next to a human skull. Just see how much smaller they are. And, uh... Yeah, it just, just goes to show that Humans used to be a lot. Sorry, Beamsy, your comment caused me pain. <laughs> it goes to show humans used to be a lot more diverse than they are today. 
like the variation we see within Homo erectus puts what we call the modern human races to shame. Alrighty. And now we have Homo neanderthalensis, the human of the Neander Valley. So everyone knows about Neanderthals. Everyone. And they lived between about 400 and 40,000 years ago. You could consider them our sister species. Both of us were descended from uh, Homo erectus, though there might have been another species in between. Um, but whereas Homo sapiens evolved in Africa, Homo neanderthalensis evolved and stayed in Europe during the Ice Age. So they were very, very well adapted to the cold. Their limbs were shorter proportionally than modern humans, and they were big barrel-chested people. Like, they would have been very good at holding in heat compared to modern humans. Uh, they also had large noses, which would have helped to uh, warm up the air before it entered the rest of their body, as well as preventing them from, or helping prevent them from sweating, which... It's kind of important if you live in a cold region. <laughs> and an interesting thing is, their brains, well, most of their brains are equal in size to ours, but some are even larger. Uh, modern human brains usually top out at about 1,500 cubic centimeters. Neanderthals could reach as high as 1,600. Now, there are differences within the brain, many differences, or at least there seem to be, but, uh, yeah, they had big brains, and they had their own cultures. They created art. They had clothing. They had tools, and they could speak. Based on analyses of their remains, it was likely that they had really high-pitched voices, and they would have spoken more sharply than modern humans usually do. But they could speak. They were human. Not only that, they buried their dead. We have many Neanderthal burial sites where, like, we can tell a hole was dug, the body was placed within, often with things like flowers or artifacts that may have, might have been important to the individual in life. They were posed, and then they were buried. So Neanderthals might have been among the first humans to have a concept of spirituality, like a thought of what might lie beyond the natural world. And they definitely had strong connections to others. Now right over here, you can see this. This is a hollowed out bear femur. I've heard a lot of people interpret it as maybe a flute. They likely had instruments. They had jewelry. Um, we found Neanderthals that were buried with necklaces made from seashells that could only be found hundreds of miles away. So they likely had trade routes, or at least traded with other humans when they found them. And in fact, depending on where you're from, you likely have at least a bit of Neanderthal DNA. Some people have up to 5% of their total DNA being Neanderthal. So in a way, they do still live on. And you probably know some people who look a bit more like a Neanderthal than others. Sorry, that, that, that's a bit of a joke, but it, it's cool to see. Even as far back as 400,000 years, we can see humans being human. 
And now, the story of a particular Neanderthal from a northern Iraq in a cave called Shanadar. He was the first one found, so we call him Shanadar 1. But since then, since his discovery, we found 10 other Neanderthal uh, spe- Neanderthal remains. Uh, of all age ranges, males and females, we even have a baby. Uh, now he does have a nickname. He's also called Nandy. And he was a very, very unfortunate man. He had bony outgrowths uh, in his ears. So he would have been all but deaf. Uh, He had an injury to his left eye socket early in life. And it would have left him at least partially blind in his left eye. He has arthritis on his bones. And his upper right arm was withered away to almost nothing. The lower half completely missing. Might have just been cut off after it had become useless due to either an injury or uh, a deformation, a deformity, something like that. And he had many, many healed fractures all over his body. The interesting thing is, he was almost 50 years old. He was an old man especially for the time. Like, compared to modern humans, he would have been in his 80s. Equivalently, basically. And it would have been almost impossible for him to survive on his own. So, what do you think that tells us? Like other humans we've seen so far, He was cared for. He was probably loved by his family or his compatriots. He he was very tough. You're right, MX. He was a survivor. But he survived because of the care of others. Yeah, very empathetic. They were human. just like all modern humans. That brings us to our last human, Homo sapiens, or the wise human. We have records of Homo sapiens going back about 250,000 years, and all modern Homo sapiens are one species that is spread all over the world. They're the last remnants of what used to be a massive, widespread family. What used to be a, like I said, a large group that were related, that would have interbred, that had many similar characteristics. And you can see right here on this chart a pretty good showing. Like we have the brain size with the or so we have the chimpanzee over here as our possible or representing a shared ancestor. We go from small brains to large. We go from walking on all fours to walking on two legs. You can see the canine teeth shrinking over time until it doesn't really matter. And walking more on the ground. We see these trends in human evolution. And we don't really know what the future holds. Human evolution can go many, many different ways. Be interesting to see how things end up. All right. Well, a uh, big stretch. Well, that's my presentation. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed. I I went through that a lot faster than I was anticipating. Uh, not not gonna say or not gonna lie. Um, hmm. Let's see, it's only been an hour. Yeah, I think I might open up the room. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, actually, I think I will. I'll go ahead and open up the room. Uh, folks, feel free to hop on. Hop into the stream yards if you have any questions you'd like to ask. Uh, we went from uh, one viewer at the very start to uh, 13 now. So um, y'all probably didn't see everything. So if there's anything you want to go over again, uh, happy to do that. Uh, but yeah, that is that is the human story. Once again, feel free to hop on if you have any questions or just have any comments you'd like to add. Oh, and we have our first person. Hola. Hello, Ember. Howdy, howdy. How's so, it going? Oh, it's 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 an interesting night. <laughs> I'm, there's so much going on. It's it's absolutely crazy. But uh, yeah, so now I'm here. We can get started. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's 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 just absolutely nuts. I mean, as you know, I, I I sometimes try to be in multiple places at the same time, but there's so much going on. It's like my entire subscription bar is all everyone's live streaming. Like this yeah, is this is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, be uh, beamsy do knows. you have any questions about human evolution or? things you're curious about uh sure let's let's uh and, and forgive me if you've already covered this because i just got here but um there's a lot of people mentioned that uh a lot of us particularly of, of european descent have some percentage of neanderthal dna um yes obviously there was a little bit of of interbreeding but um are there any characteristics that we can look at and say that's from the Neanderthal ancestors as opposed to uh, straight up Homo sapien? Okay, so that's a little complicated. Um, in a way, yes. In a way, no. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have definitive characteristics of Neanderthals, but those characteristics could and almost certainly were to some degree convergently evolved in Homo sapiens. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as an example, Neanderthal traits would be uh, relatively short limbs, thick bones, hmm. uh, big barrel chests, hmm. wide hips. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of traits. Uh, it's hard to say that they're definitively from a Neanderthal, but, I mean, hey, if you want to go get your DNA tested, never know. Uh, my youngest actually did. Uh, she she was curious. She didn't believe me when I told her that I was half Irish, half Welsh, and half Scotch. Um, apparently the math doesn't work. Who knows? And she had no <laughs> idea what, what came from her mother's side. So she, she wanted to do her test thing. So she did a 23 and me. And apparently she's like 40% German, 40% Irish. Um, she didn't tell me if, if she showed up any Neanderthal in there, though. Maybe she also, just didn't uh, yes, care. Yes, was... the hips don't lie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's most peculiar. Um, my my father actually had the nickname of Hobbit uh, when I was little, <laughs> left over from high school apparently. Um, it wasn't just the fuzzy feet. He was also kind of, sh believe it or not, I mean, nobody here has actually seen me stand up with anything referenced nearby. But I'm... Between 510, 511, depending on which convenience store I'm going out of, I'm by mm -hmm. far the tallest member of my family. So we're, we're a stocky bunch. <laughs> well, uh, did he look anything like this at all? Um, a, a little paler. <laughs> Actually, he, he looked um, a lot... Like the lower part of my face, nose, nose and down, my my uh, brow ridge and and eyeballs are are more my mother's side. Okay. Yeah, I uh, body wise, I take after my father, but face wise, more after my mother. Yeah, it you know yeah. 
there's well as we know there's so much complexity that goes to uh mm -hmm. genetic expression it's not just the recombination of traits but it's which traits get expressed and and when you've got yeah. like a pair of dominance which one wins when you've got a pair of recessives but they're different recessives which one wins you know and uh titan brings up the genome of the earlier or of proto homo sapiens must have been largely identical to i'm guessing homo neanderthalensis or they couldn't have interbred yeah that's true uh you mm -hmm. uh the neanderthal dna is just outside of the homo sapiens range of diversity yeah it's it's um, got to be pretty hard to pin down because uh it, i don't have data to back it up but it seems to me that there was probably a lot of interbreeding in the various homo subspecies in the early days mm -hmm. because they're all like it's not just similar characteristics you know there's there's more to it than yeah. that i mean more likely than not yeah um and so Titan, the the reason why I say there might have been some convergent evolution uh, is mostly just just because Homo sapiens did live in the same areas as Neanderthals for a decent amount of time. I'm saying that there might have been some shifts towards similar features in that time. Most of them are probably due to incorporating Neanderthal DNA, but some of it could just be due to natural selection doing its thing. What do you think about uh, culture and technology? Like the, the Neanderthals had a little bit of a head start on Homo sapiens. But we know Homo sapiens love to look around the world and see what other species are doing and try to, well, ape it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I like, mean, d definitely could have happened. Almost certainly did happen to some degree. Um, the thing is, it, it's a little hard to say with certainty. But I'd say mm. most likely uh, there was some aping of what Homo sapiens was doing. Homo sapiens was aping some of what Homo neanderthalensis was doing. And mm. the descendants and we know of everybody both stole a fire from Homo erectus. <laughs> well, that might have just been passed down from Homo erectus. Yeah, yeah, probably. It's it's such a weird thing when you look at the 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 Homo family tree how many of this the subspecies come to a dead end but did they really dead end or did they blend into the main group or did they diverge from what we were calling the standardized sample enough that they appeared to be something else and the, the answer to that is yes because <laughs> unfortunately i think i could be wrong titan feel free to correct me if i'm wrong i think Homo neanderthalensis is the only other member of genus Homo that we have DNA for. At least a complete DNA uh, genome. Uh, I think we might have some isolated proteins from Homo erectus. But I don't think we have full DNA strands. Oh, also we have a Mark. A Mark has arrived. Mark, which Homo are you? Um, I'm leading towards um, what is it? Uh, Neldensis, Neldens, Neletus, Neletus, N Neleti, Neleti. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I saw that. Long arms I and you climb trees. I, I, look, my arms are pretty long. I got to admit. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm like basically my wife's grabber for high things on high places. You know, like let's face it. Um, yeah, um, that's what my so that's what my girlfriend is for me. Your girlfriend is for you. Okay, cool. Um, Man, I'm five no, five. She's does, like six foot. Does does she use okay. her wings or her beak to grab stuff for you? Uh, so I don't know if uh, you'd accept it. We are a, a trans species couple. She is a human, mostly, I think. Oh, mostly. see, when, when you sent that pic from your vacation, I was confused because you said here's a picture of my girlfriend and there was, a, you know, a, a, a big... What was it? It's not a pterodactyl. The, the, uh, the... Quetzalcoatlus. Is that what that was? I thought always yeah. thought those were big, winged snakes. Big, big thing. Yeah. Giant no, giraffe-sized no. terror. Yeah. Thing. 
Yeah, the the nightmare pigeon. Yeah, that's a Quetzalcoatlus. <laughs> Yeah, so I read, the, I watched the documentary. Highly recommend um, the about the, um, the Rising Star Cave and the fossils that they found there and the apparent burial things they had. So they were possibly um, they used tools way before Homo habilis, like sort of you know so far ago, and they might have had burial rituals way before before when we thought it was possible. Homo so, naledi did. Yes. Yep. Uh, what? What is? So, did they, they found... update the timeline estimation? Because I thought the current estimate was still two to three hundred thousand years ago. Okay. So also, for anyone curious, a... uh, here's Quetzalcoatlus next to a person. Yeah. Yep. Nightmare uh, pigeon. That's horrifying. Yep. Um, yeah. So they found a child's skeleton in rock um, that they had to MRI because they didn't want to break apart the rock, but they found a rock-shaped tool is what they called it um which was basically okay. in the child's hand right so it was buried with this thing in its hand um they think it's responsible for some of the scratches in the walls there so it may have been a tool for making artwork um huh. but the fact that it doesn't match any of the rock around it and it appears to have been shaped they can see the things where it's been shaped it appears like we were using tools way before anybody thought it was possible. Which is fascinating. Uh, yeah, but we have been seeing a lot of uh, technology sharing in the non-human species as well. Um, several uh, groups of uh, chimps and bonobos have yep. started mm -hmm. using rock and stick techniques that we previously have associated only with human yes. efforts. Yes, yep. And they're passing it down to their children, which is just fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like, so they will give their children these tools that they've used, um, which is is incredible. It's sort of showing that they not only understand the usefulness of the tool, but they understand the usefulness of the tool for their children, right? Which is incredible. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Yee, we're going to have Planet of the Apes up in here yet. I mean, well, so, technically um, it already is, but details. See, Adam here <laughs> is asking true. if China said they found the oldest man. Um, uh, Twang I man do know we have Homo about? erectus from China. Depends well, on what you mean by human, I guess. Yeah, that's true. Like an Australopithecines human? There's a, there's a question. Can't say for sure. I mean, yeah, it's, again, it's... it depends on what, what what would you call a human? What do you need to be right. a human? <laughs> it's it's a very fuzzy line. Is it even a line? <laughs> <laughs> is it just a block of gray that we're all swimming in? It it is a gray. Well, that is an excellent point because, of course, evolution hasn't actually stopped, despite what people say about how we right. remove natural selection pressure from our species. We're there's still pressures; they're just different pressures. So, they're assuming we don't wipe ourselves out or something else causes us to go extinct. There will be a future version of descendants of modern humanity who look back. And won't be sure whether we count as homo to them or should be closer to the Australopiths or who knows what. Hmm. Who knows what? What knows what? Yeah. I mean, honestly, mm. I think the main selective force might just be sociality. Like, if you're Sexual more selection adept. Stuff. Yeah, like if you're more adept in social situations, more adept at yeah, having sure. more mates, you'll have more children. Mm -hmm. Just since survival isn't as big of a need anymore. Oh, yeah, now it's, it's, it's more economic. When, uh, uh, Beamsy asks when Homo lost its baculum. I don't think, I don't think any of the apes have a baculum. Um. Hmm. 
Oh, no. Okay, apparently chimps and gorillas do. Huh. Hmm. So that is an interesting question. That's a question for Erica, probably. I mean, like, the biggest problem is, like, e even in our closest relatives, like, it's such a tiny bone, it'd be insanely easy for it to get lost. You'd have... You'd have to have near perfect preservation of the pelvic region, which is extremely rare. You probably wouldn't get that until the humans started burying. Um, according to Oxford Academic, the baculum was lost and gained multiple times, so it may have come back in. Hmm. Uh, the baculum evolved who... a minimum of nine times and was lost a minimum of ten times. Huh. Uh, for, for anyone who doesn't know what a baculum is, uh, most mammals well, well, have first, a bone. Ask, in ask their people to thing. guess what. What? Oh. <laughs> I was going to say, what is the bone what, that Beamsy is thingy? most likely Just to ask penis. about? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Look, man, I don't know what it's a like penis bone right now, but yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the penis bone. But look, my my educational content is all ages. Debunking creationists is eighteen. Plus. Look, nobody tell Kent Hovind about the baculum. All right, nobody tell Kent Hovind because he'll do a series on it. Oh, uh, Memesy has a question for you, Ember. Hmm. No, I I, I would never. I I might <laughs> condemn Beamsy to eternal suffering in in the pits of of Hades, but. <laughs> As I frequently invoke, damn it, Beamsy, but. <laughs> I, I did bring up something in this pre presentation I'm actually curious about. Like, what is the earliest evidence we have for, like, say, stuff like a bag or a sling? Ooh, stuff yeah, pockets. Ooh. Pockets. Mm. Yeah, that's that's one of our best technologies. It's probably got to be a, using a leaf to carry things, like a wide leaf, right? Like, I don't know. I think I think it might have uh, might have been one of the early steps in skinning things, right? Like you you kill something, and if you don't if you if it's something too big, like a mammoth, you can't carry it all back to camp. So you have mm. to practice basic butchering. Some of the stuff mm. you just take as is, but some of the parts. Like, say, a liver, for example. You're going to want to wrap it up so it doesn't get all freaking nasty and covered in flies. So maybe you take a piece of skin right. and you make a carry thing for it. Yeah. Maybe. Like, my biggest thing was just maybe. all the stone tools. Like, those take a lot of time and a lot of energy to make. You don't just want to toss them away as soon as you're done. That's Either true. you want to have a solid place where you go to craft things, or mm. you carry them with you. And it'd be really awkward to carry all that around in your hands. Hunting equipment. Possible, yeah. True. So, yeah, I maybe scabbards were our first pockets. They're definitely interesting questions. I don't know if we can, you know, 100% tell where mm -hmm. where they are, uh, you know, where, where this, this originated from. Um, uh, according but, to the Smithsonian, we have some records of weaving from 26,000 years ago, but that yeah. could just be a preservation issue. Oh, yeah, yeah, because, you know, um, whatever you're using, whether it's leather or, or reeds or if they figured out how to uh, make wool, for instance, like none of that stuff is going to last long term unless you seal it in a, like a Dead Sea Scroll jar kind of situation. So mm -hmm. apparently, according to this article, and this is fascinating, chimps use leafy cups to chug alcohol. <laughs> alcohol. Alcohol. Uh, chimp behavior is more sophisticated than eating fermented fruits. A popular pastime is um, uh, they they basically. Um, so it's in Guinea. Um, they collect alcoholics. Uh, hang on a second. Um, oh. oh, yeah. And uh, uh, what they points take... out being able to carry water is an amazing tool. 
Oh, the yeah. The chin strength yeah. is sapped by turning the left behind palm leaves into cups. They would fold or soak a leaf until it held enough liquid to tip into their mouths. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, so if, but, if early humans had a similar thing, then it would only take one person having a flash of inspiration to be like, I should make a permanent version of this. And then right. iteration upon iteration, now like what said, you can carry water, so it increases mm. it increases your capacity for a lot of things. Right. Like you, you can move more than three days away from a water source. That's huge. Mm. And Does it like, always annoy you when people say, oh, look at the monkey? It, it always annoys the crap out of me. <laughs> I, it, it, it irritates me a tiny bit, but at the same time, they aren't entirely wrong. It, it, it's a thing. It's uh, a thing. Yeah. But that's like saying, like, you know, you point to a human and go, look at the fish. Uh, mm. Okay, I will say what does irritate me is when, uh, like, some YouTube video will show footage of an orangutan or something, and they'll call it a chimp or a gorilla. That yeah, irritates me. Yeah. Because yeah. all the modern apes are so distinct, like... Oh, you absolutely. just don't know what the heck you're talking well, about. Well, they're a bit idiot. they're a bit easier to confuse at like when they're young, like when they're babies, kind of thing. I would understand that, but like a, a, a full grown orangutan with a full grown grown um, gorilla, for instance, there, there's no mistaking the difference. Yeah. Oh, also, actually, uh, I had to do some uh, research on. Orangutans for this. Did you know that orangutans have like a second puberty? I did not. Tell me so, more, like, because I've heard about this in uh, a few different sources where there's there's a possibility that humans might be moving in that direction. Uh, so uh, orangutans uh, will develop to fully mature males. Like they're sexually mature. They can mate, have offspring and stuff. Um, but they don't develop like the big cheek flanges and they don't get to, they don't get like a throat pouch mm. unless there are no other fully formed males in the area. Wow. So it might be like a pheromonal thing or a mm. social thing, but they just won't have those developments until there is no other large male present. Uh, and humans do have a second puberty. Um, the time for it is just highly variable. It can be anywhere from like 17 to 25. Uh, second puberty is usually when most of the facial hair starts coming in and like the voice really deepens. Mm -hmm. So like you can usually tell the voice of a young adult apart from a fully mature adult. That's when that happens. Oh, the sunflower spring to mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Titan brings up gorilla. Gorilla really is what the genus and species is called for yes. gorillas. Yeah, it's wait, like, I, like uh, wait, there's two there's subspecies. I think it's like gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. Hmm. It, it reminds me of the, the thing with bears. Like, uh, I forget if it's grizzlies or brown bears, but one of them, their name is Bear, Bear, Bear. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah, uh, yeah, just double checked. The uh, Western Lowland Gorilla is Gorilla, Gorilla, Gorilla. Love it. <laughs> Wait, Specificity. Savage in 1847. <laughs> Thomas Stoughton Savage. That is a name. As opposed to Megilla gorilla, which is um, <laughs> a completely different species altogether. <laughs> Man, 
man, I, I drove like 12 hours yesterday. My back is killed. Uh, Max, you got a beautiful voice. Stop. Stop. What now? Oh, just Max in chat. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and uh, uh, Titan brings up we see similar things in other species. Like grasshoppers don't become locusts until there's a crap ton of them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's and a they all weird just phenomenon change at too. Once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, oh. so social triggers for, you know, physiological change is, is not that uncommon. And then uh, MX, is it Max? Is that who this is? Yeah, it's Max. Just just call it Max. You know. uh, Ask me about the stone day hypothesis. I mean, hmm. it's possible yeah. that it at least could have made them possible. think about new things. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, would, I, mean, I don't maybe... know if we can say it had a major role. Though. Yeah, I, I, I'm skeptical because in order to develop consciousness the way we think of it required neurological development, which required getting mm -hmm. up an energy gradient to be able to afford to embiggen that part of the brain. So yep. if it were already there, then we don't need hallucinogens. If we didn't have it, the hallucinogens wouldn't do anything, you know? So I don't think it's necessarily relevant, although I, it may have caused us from a practical I mean, rather than an evolutionary development. Um, I, I mean... Hallucinogens can have their effects in other species with smaller brains. It so can I have an effect, but it won't cause... Like, if you don't have the capacity for curiosity, it won't inspire curiosity, if that makes Actually, sense. Actually, it's one of, one of those things where, like, they got the LSD and put it on a spider, and the spider's web was zany creative, like, incredibly creative. If you've <laughs> never was seen it that creative, oh, or was yeah. it just incapable of functioning like an enormous well, oh, no. oh have you have you not seen the meme about the spiders it, doing the it's a meme yeah yeah like they they show a marijuana and it's super lazy uh yeah. lsd it's super creative uh cocaine the spider jumps off and shoots you with a gun hops in a car and drives away but it's based on an <laughs> actual thing that meme is based on an actual yeah, yeah, study I know, that I they did um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Titan did bring up earlier we do have Denisovan DNA. Sorry, I did see that. I forgot to highlight it. Thank you, though, Titan. And so one part, actually, to sort of talk on what Max was talking about, one part that I do, I find more plausible. I, I don't think it's plausible that psychedelics developed the hominid brain, right? I don't, I don't think that's plausible. However, did it did it contribute to the development of religion is the much more plausible oh, question. Yeah, I could definitely right? see that. Or at least spirituality. Or spirituality or animism, you know, basic sort of, you know, very, very primitive religious structure. Um, and that that is something with a much higher degree of, of plausibility. Did it contribute to our social systems at all? Who knows? That's such a hard question. But it yeah. does, you know, it's an interesting question, Max. Absolutely. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'd love to know the answer, but it's just one of those things where we yeah. might never know. Unless we get time oh, machine. We'll probably will never know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, and Biggin, listen, if Shakespeare can make up words, so can I. Nice. <laughs> Or should I say, oh. Noiki? <laughs> so, uh, there was a thing I had in my presentation that was a, I, I thought was really fascinating. It's a, uh, it is a video that's showing a chimp walking, how Lucy would have walked, and how a human walks, and just okay. showing the similarities and differences. Would you guys like to see it? Sure. And I just want to add, um, Ember, technically all words are made up. That's true. true, true. <laughs> oh, come on. Are, do uh, they even really count behave. as words at a certain level? Because really, we're just using sound waves to convey concepts which trigger ideas and understandings in the recipient's brain. So it's really kind of a facilitated telepathy, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, sort of. Well, on my brain Depends right on now. how you define yeah. telepathy. <laughs> mm. 
Oh, and uh, just in case anyone wants to check out this video, which I highly encourage you do, it's titled Walking with Lucy, published by the California Academy of Sciences. Excellent video. They do a lot of great stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Highly recommended. And we start off with a chimp and Lucy. And they highlight the similarities between them. The, this bit right here, I wish they had a male Australopithecus here in this. Uh, just because Australopithecus are insanely sexually dimorphic. Mm -hmm. uh, like it, it's midway between Homo sapiens and gorillas. It's really distinct. And the males are much less built for climbing than the females are. That makes sense. Yeah, the, the males are bigger, stronger. The escape um, mechanism is climbing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I go over it earlier in the presentation, but like the degree of sexual dimorphism in primates in particular actually has a ton of implications for the social structure. So just having the bones, we can get, get a decent idea of what their social structure would have been. It's kind of neat. And also just how awkward the chimp moves on two legs. <laughs> like I relate. <laughs> Whenever I'm on two legs, I'm awkward as hell. Yeah, it looks <laughs> like me when I've just got out of bed. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then in comparison to the human. Like they're moving differently, but similar. So tiny. Oh yeah, Lucy was only like three foot something. Mm-hmm. Hobbit says. <laughs> Not quite. Not quite Hobbits yet. <laughs> and then what they I love about the ring, my precious, is they show all three. So, which does Lucy look more like? At least when in motion. You know, I have never met a human who walks anywhere near that upright. So what do you I, mean? I do it's agree like, to some extent. Like these are idealized models; they have like posture yeah. and shit. Like, I'm pretty sure what they did with the human was they had someone in a motion capture rig and told them to walk as smooth as possible. So it's a bit exaggerated for the human, but it still gives a pretty good idea. Like, this is a very upright. No, I, I get it. It's, it's just a, a comparison video. I'm just I'm just noticing yeah. that, like, I don't walk like that. I don't know anyone who walks <laughs> like that. <laughs> Okay. See, I had to look away from the chat a bit to actually see that. Uh, yeah, Beams is asking about the thing between intelligence, religion, and schizophrenia. Yep. Go go ahead, Beamsy. You have you have fun with Sam. I I don't want to deal with him anymore. Understandable. Just, just worthless. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the conversation was so worthless. Yep. Like I get, I get. Beams, he's trying to poke, poke Sam and get a reaction out of him. Mm -hmm. That's what you want to do. Cool. It's just, it's not a productive conversation, in my opinion. It's just never going to be a productive conversation. Sam. Also, he he's, sent um, me a music recommendation. I'm scared. Who, Sam or or, or Beamsy? Beamsy. <laughs> Which one? Ah, uh, yeah, I'd be scared too. Okay, I'd be scared too. I like that VMZ, but this stream would be taken down immediately. Hmm. But, uh, uh, yeah, like well, I, if you don't have posture, perhaps you should like sort of you know get some posture. Posture is important. Like a uh, in this presentation, I tried to weave a bit of 
primate education in. And if you have enough specimens of a species to be able to tell the different sexes in primates, it's really easy for you to get a good idea of their social structure. Primates are one of the few animals where it seems to be very tightly tied to the differences between the sexes. It's fascinating. As long as you know, uh, Beamsy. As long as you know. I don't know what Beamsy say. No, no, he's oh. just saying he knows it's yeah. pointless. As long as you know, that, that's cool. Wouldn't want to give you false hope. The basic trend is the less sexually dimorphic, the more likely you are to have just mating pairs or promiscuous. Uh, well, I don't want to say breeding, but promiscuous mating events. And we see a decent back and forth throughout the history of humans. Like uh, Aurorin here and Artipithecus, fairly low sexual dimorphism. But then the Australopithecines turn it up a few notches. Interesting. Well, does anyone else have any questions about uh, human evolution or anything in the chat? So otherwise, I might start drawing this to a close. Oof. You got any questions, Mark? No, no, I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. All right. Ember had to go do a thing. A Ember's perpetually multitasking. Ah, perpetually. I see, I see. Uh, well. Uh, I will say to the chat, I am thinking and leaning towards doing a video on the uh, the Neanderthals of Shanadar Cave. Uh, could be pretty interesting. Um, we have 11 Neanderthals from the cave. Two later human burials, which is interesting. Oh, and uh, Beamsy has a question for you, Mark. Oh, uh, what's what's the question? Are you a Homo calvitium? Not sure what Not he's to referring to. Knowledge. Yeah, I have no idea what he's talking about. No, uh, I'll say a no because uh, you know, presumably it's a Calvin and Hobbes thing. I don't. What would that ah. make you Hobbes? I I don't know. <laughs> um, oh. oh yeah Sam doesn't want to accept that we are great ape or that humans are great apes yeah no he humans are absolutely one apes second great apes just even if you don't accept evolution just anatomically speaking they, they yeah. cannot be anything else in the animal kingdom which Well, the question would be what what um, what taxonomically do they have that would separate them from the other apes? So usually when you pose that to creationists, they will in some way say morality or some other thing that's sort of ephemeral, that doesn't really exist or, or is, is spiritual in nature or some kind of um, some kind of sort of um, ethereal property kind of thing but you know when you're talking taxonomically all you're talking about is is the physiological you know yeah the, the morphology attributes of something yeah the morphology that, that's essentially what you're talking about so i've yet to hear anything you know because you can say hey a, a large brain size well other apes have a large brain size you know just because ours is larger doesn't mean or larger as a percentage of the body doesn't mean that they don't have a large brain size um, it's it's not how large it is, it's how you use it. Yeah. Uh, I was is that a line from your uh, alt account here in the chat, Ember? 
What now? This one. Oh no, no, that's that's uh, <laughs> one one of my good friend stalker people. Oh sure, sure. Ember's member. Wow, wow! <laughs> I thought I'd seen it all. Apparently, I hadn't seen it all. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's not. it's not easy being a trans person when when your pieces parts wander off and do their own thing. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, Max has clarified the Calvinium was a joke on baldness uh, in Spanish. Calvo oh. equals bald. Okay. Well, you know. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh max also asks why do creationists get so upset when they're called apes because it, it would make them less special that that's basically it so okay. the bible so says I, I humans had... were created separately from yeah i've had to explain this one the problem is also adam and eve right so it, it's a it's a wild ride follow me on this one so if there was no Adam, if evolution is true, there is no Adam and Eve. And if, if we came from apes instead of being created, there's no Adam and Eve. If there's no Adam and Eve, there's no original sin. If there's no original sin, then there's no reason for Jesus to be sacrificed for, for the sins. Um, and therefore, there's no reason for him to rise again. So it all comes down to is humanity um, sort of born into sin that's that's the main thing that's the reason ah uh, well i mean on that topic and just just hear me out here adam and eve eh eh adam and eve eh oh nothing It was it that bad? <laughs> Mark? But I, I didn't see it. Sorry, I'm just doing something else at the moment. Um oh. where's where's Adam? Oh, uh Adam and Eve. Yeah, they're not even the same species. Uh, that that's obviously not how that works. I mean you Do could you think point they would to care? um well, you, you, you could point to sort of, you know, mitochondrial Eve and chromosome Y Adam basically as well, but that doesn't yeah. make it the Adam and Eve of the Bible. So, yeah. Oh, uh, Beamsy says you are uh, planning your revenge against him. <laughs> Who? Beamsy. Beamsy? No, no, Beamsy. Beamsy. I'm not going to take <laughs> revenge on Beamsy. That's what, not worth my time, quite frankly. Beamsy's mm. body takes revenge against Beamsy. That's basically what happens. Masks at Max asks, uh, "Do we know what made us lose our fur?" Uh not really. We don't. We're not one hundred percent sure where in the human lineage we even lost it, or where humans lost it. Considering modern humans still have fur, it's just very sparse. Um, no. I mean, maybe the development of clothing made it so we or so humans didn't need fur. Maybe it was just constant exposure to the sun and constant exposure to the heat. Uh, fur makes it a lot less efficient to radiate heat. So maybe it had something to do with the evolution of sweating. It It's complicated. Evolution's complicated. Unfortunately, hair doesn't fossilize easily. That so, uh, or that said, I think I am going to call it to a close. Uh, thank you, too, for joining me for a short while. Thank you, everyone Wonderful. in the chat, for hanging around and listening to the mad rambling about apes. <laughs> yeah, and make sure you do give a like and subscribe to Doc Dino if you're not subscribed already. And if you do want to see more content, don't forget to ring the bell. Why don't I ever do this on my own videos? What's wrong it's, with it's me? It's hard to do it for your own stuff. It's much easier to I show know. for other people. It's, it's so, so crazy. I 
Uh, well, thank you, thank you, no. thank you. No. Uh, please do check out both of these fine folks. And uh, you just uploaded a new video today, which I think was a cut of us laughing at AIG or something like that. That's right. It, oh, it that's was fun. that um, uh, kinesin protein thing from the AIG Canada Challenge. Evolutionists can't explain <laughs> this, and yet we did. The, the walking ball sack, that's right. Yes. Hmm. Well, that's uh, fine. I've got to check Mark, that out. Mark, do you have anything coming up? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I just did a stream on on the whole uh, atheist not allowed on Rebecca's channel kind of thing, which was, was interesting. That was fascinating. I, I feel compelled to, so I do apologize for sort of putting that on when you had something. I didn't, I didn't realize. Oh, don't, um, don't need to apologize. You have your own channel. Okay. I was absolutely compelled. Like, I could not. I could not stop. I, I just couldn't. So, but it was interesting. It was interesting, and I got to talk to some people who were, who were really interesting. So that that was cool. Uh, yeah, you had a that, lot probably, going on in there. Yeah, no, it was it was really fascinating, and I really wanted to examine the way that we engage with people as atheists, and and I guess to a lesser degree as scientists, kind of thing, which was fascinating, but. Um, yeah, it, it was really interesting, and uh, this this has been really cool. So thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm probably going to duck out because I do have to get lunch as well. Sounds good. I'm going to have some late dinner. <laughs> late dinner. Okay. No worries. Stay hydrated, right. folks. Yeah. Later, everybody. <laughs> good night. Bye-bye.